what are the kinds of limitations or challenges associated with confidential computing when we're training big AI models like the large language models that are everywhere now in generative AI? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, before I mention the challenges, I can uh, mention a little bit the goals of what ideally would be amazing to have is we want to, <clears throat> we want the prediction. So the queries that the users ask, you know, we want the users to have privacy, right? These queries could be, for example, uploading proprietary code from an enterprise um, IP, like the case of Samsung, where an employee uploaded proprietary code mm -hmm. to ChatGPT mm -hmm. and basically revealed company secrets to ChatGPT in order to get some help to be more productive. But ideally, we'd like that to be protected. So with confidential computing, the nice thing is that you can put the model in an enclave, the LEM provider can put the LEM model in an enclave in the cloud, and then users can send encrypted queries to the enclave. And so the LEM provider cannot see those queries. There's a guarantee from the hardware, an enforcement from the hardware and the encryption. There's no way they can see what those queries are, yet they can still process the inference with high performance and respond. So now all these organizations and their employees can use ChatGPT or all the other you know, LLMs without being concerned that the LEM provider sees proprietary company data. So that's one really big goal. Um, Another goal is to maybe, if you're training from sensitive data sets and confidential data that the LLM provider shouldn't see, then you can actually do this training also in the enclaves. So what are the main challenges left? I would say that right now the confidential computing uh, community is really well established around the CPUs. The GPUs are much newer. So it's the Hopper architecture, which is much newer. They're getting right now available on the cloud. They're about to be available in preview. So it's super new in, in the cloud. So I'd say there's still this incorporating the GPU enclaves in the cloud and then just optimizing these pipelines and workflows. It's um, something that we still need to you know, work and engineer. So on the opaque side, we've been doing a lot of this engineering even and thinking even outside of the cloud yet, but the nice thing is to have them on the cloud and to really get the best performance and um, that, that one can deliver. So I'd say it's still a little bit of unknown there because this GPU enclave technology is very new. On the CPU world, we know how things are very well, but we need GPUs here. So in order to be able to get ahead of what consumers will need, does this mean that you at Opaque Systems potentially get access to like these new hopper architectures and you get to like try them out and figure out how you're going to do confidential computing and have your pipelines and workflows in the cloud be efficient um, ahead of time before consumers have access to that, to that kind of chip. Absolutely. And um, so with the peak systems, a lot of our technology was built on top of our open source and research in our lab at UC Berkeley. And for example, this was even years before the NVIDIA enclaves became available we had a partnership with Microsoft where we did research on how we do machine learning, neural networks, and, and analytics on a GPU architecture, GPU enclave architecture. It was all in simulation mode, but oh, it still teaches you a lot oh. about how to build the system on top of that. So we have a few years, um, I would say, advanced because of that research at UC Berkeley. Can you dig into that a bit more? I find that really fascinating for some reason, so maybe our listeners will too. So I had never thought of this before. I'll actually, I guess I had kind of in the realm of quantum computing, for example, you'll have like, I know that there are tools you can go and use online where you can see what it would be like. You have these simulations of what it would be like um, to be using quantum computing to solve a particular problem. So you can kind of get used to the, to the feel of that, even if it doesn't have the actual performance benefits of quantum computing. Um, so maybe this is kind of similar to that, but, but that's, I, I admit it had never occurred to me that there would be other kinds of applications. So I'd love to hear more about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, for whoever is interested also, we have a paper called visor, uh, it's published at the top security conference using next security. So, um, I mean, the idea is that first you need to know what is the API that the GPU enclave is going to expose. And then on top of that API, you can build your system and in simulation mode, you can still get a pretty good sense of the performance. Um, you, it's not going to run for real, but you're going to get a pretty good sense of maybe how many cycles it's going to take and 
some other metrics that you can then um, easily kind of do an estimation to the, for the real hardware. Of course, there are some differences between the simulation architecture we use Graviton and the real NVIDIA enclaves, um, but it still prepares the thinking for the real hardware. So it still gives us an advance having had the chance to work in that simulated environment. Nice. Okay. Well, I won't take us off on that tangent for too long, Luca, but that was fascinating on the simulations. Thank you. Um, so back to LLMs. Um, so at my company, Nebula, we, um, we have generative AI models. We have our own proprietary LLMs. And so I can see how um, these kinds of solutions you're describing where our clients can be using LLMs without us, without my company Nebula, being able to see any of their data. So they're, they can feel confident in their employees sending data to us, which is important. So we hear sometimes when we are prototyping a new generative AI capability, we'll use something like an open AI API, GPT-4, to prototype it and make sure that it works well. But then in uh, pitches, in, in client calls, prospective client calls, they say, uh, you know, you're going to have to be using your own LLMs. You won't be able to send uh, our data off to that third-party API to OpenAI. And it's because of things like people being burned, like the Samsung example that you gave that actually comes up in our client calls frequently. Um, and it's interesting because um, while the OpenAI license is quite permissive for ChatGPT, actually for the API, they don't, unless you specifically opt in, they don't store your data for more than 30 days. And even just that 30 days that they do store it for is for the purposes of monitoring for abuse. Um, so, uh, but, I, but you can see how people are like, oh no, that's a company we need to avoid. However, so going one step further, we already know some people wanna be avoiding sending things to OpenAI specifically, but there are surely lots of people out there who want to avoid sending even data to me. <laughs> um, like to our own LLMs. Um, so uh, yeah, there's a lot of our episodes recently on the show have focused on various open source architectures that you can download and then fine tune. And we've had tons of episodes about techniques like low rank adaptation, LoRa, um, these parameter efficient fine tuning techniques for being able to take pre-trained, really powerful open source LLMs, fine tune them to specific tasks, we've had, my data science team is regularly demoing things to me that I'm like, you built this? We have this? It blows my mind what's possible today. And probably regular listeners might even be tired of hearing me say it. But anyway, it's so this light bulb has gone off for me that particularly for our enterprise clients, I'm sure there are some out there that if we said, we're using opaque systems to take your data and we can't see it. It's just the bare metal enclaves that are going to have access. Uh, none of your uh, proprietary information is going to be even possibly seen by us, by hackers. I can see the huge advantage to that in pitches. And uh, I don't know if I've left you with anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> you got it very, very right. You're very right. Um, absolutely. So I think that's really, I think a, a lot of the power of the LLMs will come when you use proprietary company data, not just the you know public web data and exactly like you said with opaque and confidential computing you can put the foundational model inside the LLMs and you can do your fine tuning in there on very confidential customer data and then you can still keep the model in there right and answer prediction results that way yeah, that's even a step further than what I just said, because I was just thinking about inference time. So mm -hmm. I was just thinking, oh, at inference time with a confidential computing system, I would be able to say to my clients, you know, we won't uh, get access to your data. But yes, I didn't. Yeah, I, I could be fine tuning on their data without seeing their data. That's wild. Absolutely. You could be running any part of this in confidential computing. So you could protect users' queries um, by keeping them encrypted and doing the inference encrypted, but you can also do the fine tuning in encrypted form. So you can have the whole pipeline encrypted and then the customer really is assured that nothing about their data is revealed to you or OpenAI or anybody else. But again, there's flexibility. If they just want to, if you just want to run some part of it, for example, you say, hey, I really want to see that model I'm fine tuning because I, by seeing it, I can do lots of other cool, interesting tricks and whatnot. You can, and then you can keep the inference only in encrypted form and protect the user queries, or you can 
have the model fine tuning also be in encrypted form and say, I want to protect the data that it's fine tuning using, but then I'm going to see the model or maybe not see the model. You see, you have the perfect flexibility here of what you want to keep protected and what you want to see and who can see it. Nice. Yeah, really exciting. You're opening my mind to lots of possibilities right now in real time. It's awesome. We actually have, um, uh, so we built a prototype like this in Opaque using the Vicuna uh, open source yes. model. We actually yes. developed Vicuna in our lab, in the Sky Lab at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's a fine-tuned uh, llama, basically, but it's, um, we also, in our lab, we're running this chatbot arena where we have users compare and contrast what are the best uh open source uh, models and actually even compared to ChatGPT closed source. And so Vicuna, our open source model is the best performing from, from the open source one. So that's yeah. quite exciting. Yeah, Vicuna is a recurring topic on the show. And for listeners that aren't aware of it, uh, episode number 670 was dedicated to Llama. And then episode 672 was dedicated to uh, Vicuña, Alpaca, GPT for All J, Dolly 2.0, these various open source uh, single GPU um, LLMs that are available out there. Um, and I guess while I'm on it, then episode 674 was about this parameter efficient fine tuning with Laura that we were also talking about a few minutes ago that allows you to take these open source models and fine tune them. So Vicuña, for example, they Berkeley, <laughs> you <laughs> um, took the the this llama these llama weights that Meta um, didn't open source, <laughs> um, but provided to researchers, um, including I can imagine Berkeley, in order to uh, to fine tune. And it's it's really mind blowing. Like the amount of data required to fine tune so effectively to something like Vicuña that you're saying, you know, gets these state-of-the-art uh, state of performance on benchmarks like you have in, in the arena that you mentioned. It's wild how like just a few hundred or at, in most cases, a few yeah. thousand examples. Yeah, uh, yeah like the, it, it's, it's the, like the, um, the flexibility and capability of the LLMs out of the box with this just this little bit of fine tuning on top um, I think perplexity is like the best word for that, right? Where you get these these emergent capabilities on such a small amount of fine tuning that is just stunning. Like typically, we're seeing, uh, you know, my data science team on typically like the second or maybe the third iteration on trying to be able to do some task, absolutely nail it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It's it's really impressive. Um, also, I do want to mention that uh, Vicunia is developed by my colleagues in the same lab. So I know, the I know. I know. Here and I, the security I, part, I'm, <laughs> when I I'm, said you, it was a very royal you. It was thank you. I, I appreciate it. I, I, yeah, it's it's very good of you to make sure that I'm not implying. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah. yeah um, my my colleagues, um, Joey Gonzalez, Jan Stoika, and his students are absolutely amazing doing the Vicuna, and I'm taking care of the security and confidentiality part. Um, one thing that's very interesting there is that even when we have open source models, a lot of um, users are not going to want to you know, de develop their own infrastructure to run them and to do the inference. We know it's costly. We know it's expensive. The inference is actually more expensive than training uh, because of the sheer volume of queries. So even in that case, they'll actually might want to put these open source models on some cloud, right? On some or, or with some provider, right? To provide a service. So yet again, we're back to the situation where some provider can see our queries, even though in principle we could run um, and host ourselves this open source. It just sometimes takes a lot of effort. That's another place where confidential computing can really come into place extremely handy. And uh, for example, if you put this open source model inside Opaque in the cloud, then you don't have to worry about creating the infrastructure for hosting the LLM. You don't have to worry about the fine tuning on your sensitive data because it's all protected and can run in the clouds. So you don't have to set up this infrastructure on-prem. It's again about making this very easy to use and frictionless. Nice, yeah, all really great points. And it's interesting, uh, we guess we don't say enough on air, the point that you just made about how inference is typically more expensive. I mean, you hope that whatever platform you're building with these LLMs or whatever feature you're building is gonna take off 
But if it does take off, then it's like, you know, you think about these potentially huge costs of training an LLM, especially if you're training from scratch. If you're taking an open source LLM and fine tuning it, the, the PEF can actually be extremely inexpensive. You could be talking about hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars in compute to train the model, but then it's at the inference time that it's going to be crazy. Absolutely. So then you have to have a platform, right, that supports this. And then let's say you're a company that's, you know, mid-size or smaller and you just, your business is not about setting up infrastructure for your LLM, right? That's not your focus. That's not what you want to spend time on. That's not what you want to hire for or, you know, build infrastructure. And the idea is you just want to kind of delegate it for ease of use. So then again, you're going to delegate it to some other provider or to a cloud. So that's where, once again, you will need to think about the confidentiality of your queries, the data you fine tune using, the resulting fine tune model, because you know the weights can also leak information. Many times, neural networks remember too much, right. and, and so forth. Awesome. Well, so we've now talked a fair bit about open source LLMs and how people might not want to share information with the big providers like OpenAI. But what if you do? What if you want the best? cutting edge API capabilities, the best generative AI capabilities. So you want to use MidJourney, you want to use the OpenAI GPT-4 API. Um, if people are insisting on doing that, then are there steps that they can take to help safeguard their privacy anyway? Absolutely, very, very good question. And really, um, then the question is, one of what if a query contains PII information and you're sending a query with PII information to GPT-4. And I can completely understand why people might want to still use GPT-4. It's extremely good, right? Um, so one of the solutions we're working on at Opaque and we should have in, in the next quarter, it's not yet ready, is this idea of stripping off the answer stripping from the query, the PII information. So we're using again, an LLM-like model to figure out what's the PII information, but it doesn't have to be as good as GPT-4 to answer the query and replacing it with symbolic information so that GPT-4 can still reason in terms of that information, provide to us a helpful answer. And then we replug back in to that answer, replace the symbols with the information. And also wow. at times we tag the query with relevant context. All right. Talk me through an example. <laughs> <laughs> like, Give me an example so I can wrap my head around that. Absolutely. So um, let's say that um, I have um, the medical report of a patient that contains SSN, name, date of birth. Um, and I want to upload this um, whole document to GPT-4 that contains a lot of medical information. And then I just want to ask useful questions such as, when did this uh, patient last go to the doctor? When is their upcoming appointment? Um, what is their you know, current uh, pills that they have to take and whatnot? Basically, we need GPT-4 to synthesize this long medical record for us and be able to answer very, you know, very direct and simple questions. So the idea then is that inside Opaque, inside Enclaves, we're going to ingest this medical report. Again, Opaque is not going to see it. And we're going to take out the PII. We're going to take usernames out. We're going to take social security numbers, date of births, very personal information out, but then keep, replace uh, that with some symbols. I then we're going to send... So, so you, you could literally, you could instruct the LLM, you could say, you know, we're replacing um, sensitive information with like codes, uh, the codes will look like this, uh, Absolutely. you can just like, yeah, you know, don't worry about the specific content in that code. Absolutely. So let's say we call this patient X instead of, uh, you know, um, I know, Alice, um, Alice is our usual victim in anything cryptography, <laughs> <laughs> Alice, Bob, and Malice. Um, <laughs> so let's say we replace uh, Alice with you know, patient X and we send this new medical record with a lot of this PII replaced with code names and we instruct the LEM about these code names. And then the LEM is going to answer patient X last went to the doctor on this date. And we're going to, back in opaque, we're going to change that X to be uh, Alice, right? So the user sees an answer as if everything had gone directly to ChatGPT 
and to GPT-4, right? For the, from the user's perspective and experience is the same as if they're talking to GPT-4, but the difference is that GPT-4 doesn't get to see any PII data. They only see symbols. And Opaque is going to handle all of that in enclaves using confidential computing. So Opaque itself doesn't see those PII. Nobody sees that PII. That makes so much sense to me. It's interesting that when you first explained it, I thought it was going to be like really hard to wrap my head around, but it's crystal clear. That example <laughs> is uh, so obvious. Like it's, uh, I can see exactly how that would work and I can imagine that it would work flawlessly all of the time. Um, so just making sure that it's something that happens smoothly and easily is the kind of thing that Opaque can provide. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, it really comes with uh, advantages for compliance. For example, HIPAA compliance is very clear about what you need to ensure. And by switching to symbols, you can ensure compliance with regulations like HIPAA.